something like decriminalization is happening in, in most of the rich world now, if not officially, then unofficially. And it's worth just making clear, when we talk about decriminalization, that's a different thing from legalization. Decriminalization means that something is still banned, it's still illegal, but it's no longer a criminal offence. And then the other stuff that's interesting, and I think probably more radical still, is the legalization that we're seeing uh, in cannabis. And, and this is happening in so far four states of the US. Canada is going to do it, Uruguay is doing it, uh, Jamaica has said it will do it too. Governments are desperate for revenue. You know, we, our public services are under a lot of strain. The milk cow of the banking sector isn't producing as much milk, so we need new sources of revenue. Uh, and, you know, taxing um, decriminalised drugs, or well, they'd have to be legalised to be taxed, uh, would provide a, a, a genuine um, attraction for government. And then you know, instead of money going into criminals, they'd be, they'd be going to you. And this is an important difference because with decriminalization, you make things easier for users, but the supply side of the business, i.e. the dealing, is still illegal. So if you go to Portugal and buy cocaine, you'll be fine, you know, you won't be arrested, you won't go to prison. But the cocaine that you've spent your euros on it still comes from the same cartels in Mexico and elsewhere that make their money cutting off people's heads. And the important thing about legalization is that you bring the whole business into the legal world. And, and in, if you go to Colorado and buy a joint there, uh, the cannabis has been grown by tax-paying, uh, law-abiding people. If you really opened up the whole system, just treated it like any other commodity, maybe a taxed commodity like cigarettes and alcohol, what, what would the effects be? I think what, one of the effects, at least initially, would be quite uncomfortable because once you eliminate the smugglers and the cartels, it's then much easier for people to export freely. So there'll be more stuff coming in, drive down the street price, People would consume more because it would be cheaper and it would be less fraught with police hazards. So you would get more people into drugs initially. Cannabis drinks they do now, they can do cannabis everything. You can imagine that appealing to you know, new audiences. Um, you can imagine a, a large kind of big, big marijuana emerging in the way that we currently have big tobacco. So the idea is that you make drugs, um, you have economies of scale, they're cheaper, they're safer, and then also you outcompete the the drug gangs. Um, do they just go into cybercrime or something else instead? What evidence do we have? The question you raise about them moving into other types of crime is a legitimate one, and there's evidence already that farmers in the Sierra Madre who used to grow cannabis are now growing opium poppies, which is not terribly good news. Um, and I, we see this quite a lot, you know, in Britain in the 1990s, car theft went down quite dramatically because it became a lot harder to steal cars. And at the same time, not coincidentally, we saw an increase in the number of robberies of young people. If you look at the Sinaloa cartel, they're really suffering now because, of course, in the States, if you, if you go to one of the places where they make the legal stuff, it's so much more sophisticated. I mean, I went around um, a chocolate factory in Colorado where they were making marijuana edibles, and it's just extraordinary. It's, it's like a cross between kind of Willy Wonka and, and Walter White, you know. <laughs> <laughs> And the, the Sinaloa cartel doesn't do chocolate brownies. You know, they can't compete on this stuff. 